Hello, everyone. Welcome. Hello. 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 All right. Excellent. All right. So quite a few people are joining. That's that's always amazing to to see. Uh, so I'll wait for maybe a minute or so until everyone joins, uh, and then we can start. Okay. If you have any burning questions, uh, fire away. I'm happy to answer um, your questions while we're waiting. So I hope you are busy doing the first assignment. It is due on the 10th of October. So you've got about three, three weeks left. Okay. Right. Okay. So, um, first assignment is due on the 10th of October. And, uh, okay, I don't see any questions in the chat just hello everyone excellent so those who are new and those who are returning from year 10 uh, everyone welcome w welcome to compost and just a few words why compost what are what are what we are and what are we trying to achieve okay so I like to say my favorite phrase I've tied to everyone who joins compost I say look if you want to become an athlete right you don't decide at the age of 18 oh I want to go I want to become an athlete and I'll go to athletics university and after three years I'll I'll be a qualified athlete it doesn't happen unless you start at the age of 12 or 10 you don't become an athlete even if you really, really want to, you probably not uh, don't have the necessary skills for that because you develop them over the years. Uh, if you want to be an artist, if you want to be a painter, if you want to be a musical artist, you don't start at the age of eighteen. You don't go to music university and then suddenly you are super, you're a superstar. No, they they start really, really early uh, to become a musician, and that's and but somehow. If you want to become a physicist, that's what you're expected to do. You come, you, uh, you're, eight, you're 16, and you're suddenly, hmm, what do I choose? Oh, I'll become a physicist. And you go to, you take A-levels, and then you go to university, you become a, a physicist. But it's wrong. No, but we believe it's wrong. You have to start early. You have to start uh, at an earlier age than um, when you come to, your, to, to, to university. A good physicist, start just like a good uh, musician, has to start early, and that's why you're here. Okay. You d when I say physicist, you don't have to be a physicist. We're not, uh, w but we we really think that you will benefit from uh, the subject, and uh, it's an amazing subject. I fell in love with physics when I was 13. I read a book called uh, Physics for Entertain Entertainment. Um, I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you the cover of this book. Actually, I have it say stored on my computer, so I'll just uh, drag it over. Um, yeah, and, uh, that's how I fell in love with physics and, uh, okay, I'll just grab it, drag it to our webinars. Okay. And, uh. <laughs> It is, it is an absolutely fascinating subject, and I hope I'm hope to share some of my love for physics and maths uh, today and in every every session from um, from today. Brilliant. So uh, let us start. I will share my screen.
Okay, if you can see my screen, please type one. Okay, excellent. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> well, okay, 100, uh, 100 people. So there was a question in the chat, I missed it. Uh, why is summation being used? I will, I will talk about summation preamp, so um, later, uh, later today. Okay, so let us uh, start. So this is the book I was referring to. Is called Physics for Attainment. It's a you can I think you can actually download it because it was written more than seventy years ago. Um, but it's an amazing book covering all sorts of uh, different physical ideas, and that's what brought me to physics. However, I want to start with some maths because um, you can't study physics without applying your math skills. And the first thing is, of course, drawing graphs. Drawing graphs is very important in physics. So let's uh, let's draw those graphs. I hope you know how these graphs look like. So the first graph is a direct proportion. So direct proportion. And it looks like this. It's a straight line. It's a straight line. So this is X and this is Y, and it's a straight line through the origin, like this, Y equals KX. Okay, yes, I'm happy to share the Miro link. Okay. Uh, yes, good point. Let me just share um, the syllabus. Excellent question. Thank you. That is a very syllabus. Syllabus. Where is my syllabus? Okay. Sorry, it looks a bit like a draft, but um, right. So for you will have six assignments. So you finish on the seventeenth of March. Um, so physics is ideal gases, the one that you've already done. Units, measurement, uncertainties, Hooke's law in springs, elastic potential energy, reflection, refraction, lenses, and mirrors. For maths, it's combinatorics, basic differentiation, integration, analysis of functions, Euclidean geometry, and uh, set theory. Okay, so these are the um, the topics for um, Compos Year Eleven. So coming back to graphs, I hope these graphs are familiar to you. The second graph is k over x. That's we call is the inverse proportion inverse proportion and in maths you normally draw it like this in physics we're typically interested in the top right quadrant so that's x this is y and the graph looks like this okay any, uh, this is the first session. You have not missed anything. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you look at these two equations, they look different, but they are exactly the same. It's just you, instead of Y, you have P. Instead of X, you have T. So if I ask you to draw a graph, it would be exactly the same. This is T and this is P. Whatever P and T is, we don't really even need to know. Of course, P means pressure and T means temperature. But it's the same thing. And this graph 
it's the same thing as the one above. So, sorry, that's T, and this is, so, sorry, that is not T. This is V and P. Oh, v is volume, of course, and P is pressure. And the graph looks like this. All right, does that make sense? Uh, on a scale of 0 to 10, how well do you understand this? To send 10 being, I understand everything. Super easy. Oh, some submit some familiar f names are oh, so pleasant to s see people back okay um, okay well if you were to okay there there were some uh, there were some people sh uh, showing uh, fives okay so there are some fives so let let me open a Desmos graph, and um, if I draw y equals k over x, that doesn't help because I don't know what k is, so I'm just going to use a number. So it's a constant. It's 3 over x, and you can see the shape of the graph. But if I replace it with p equals 3 over v, it's the same graph. Nothing, Nothing's changed. And P is 3 over V. So K is just a number. If you are confused with the K, K is just a number. It could be 3, for example. Yeah, it could be anything. Does uh, those who, uh, who put 5s and 6s, does that make more sense? Okay. Uh, So you need to be able to draw graphs. If you're not familiar with these graphs, you would just, uh, yeah. So graphs of uh, functions, research that topic, graphs of functions. Now, the thing is that it doesn't have to be as simple as that. If this expression could be written in a different way, we could say, Let's say it is P times uh, V equals uh, M divided by mu RT. Sounds complicated. But if we assume that V is constant and M is constant and mu is constant and R is constant, what we can we can rearrange this to write p equals m r divided by mu v t right but this is a constant this is just a constant value constant it's the same as writing p equals kt if this doesn't change so the graph of this function, even though it looks horrendous, if you if they ask you to draw a graph of p versus t, so p versus t, it's just going to be a straight line. And the gradient of that straight line, gradient, is k, which is mr over mu v, whatever that means, okay? We're not... Uh, right. Can we please reserve the chat to genuine questions? Uh, okay. Uh, I do read uh, the questions and I don't want to miss important questions. Okay. Yes, the assignment, uh, the webinar is designed to help you with the assignment. Yeah. But uh, today I'm going through the basics. You get marks for any method you use, as long as it's a, it's a valid method. Yeah, so um, um, I 
I don't know, using chat GPT and copying the answer is not a valid method. Um, okay. Right. So I hope that makes more sense. So and the same, this could be could be hidden. You could have P equals uh N R T over V where where N R T is just K is is the constant that you're looking at. So it's the same as saying K over V. And the graph would be the same. Mu, uh, in this particular case, mu is molar mass, but that's not important. Okay. Mu is uh, molar mass, but of, of the gas. Yeah, Isaac Physics, Khan Academy is really good resources. Okay, problem two. Given the equation, PV equals NRT, this is the gas equation. Draw graphs of P versus V. Okay, P versus V. That means assume everything else is constant. So assume, assume everything, everything else is constant. So what we do is we say, okay, oh, well, everything else is constant. Why do we need three letters? We just replace it with one letter. So this becomes, so first, to second, third, fourth. First graph, first, uh, we assume that N, R, and T are constant. Therefore, PV equals K, where K is just constant. Uh, you don't have to write the assignment on paper. You could do, uh, do the assignment on a, I don't know, on a tablet, for example, and upload a PDF, upload a screenshots. Okay, uh, PV equals K, and then you can rearrange that. You can divide both sides by V, and you get P equals K over V, something we are already familiar with. So P versus V. And you know how this graph looks like. It's an inverse proportion graph, like this. Two, P versus T. In this case, we assume that V, N, and R are constant. V, N, R are constant. So the graph becomes P, V equals N, R, T divide both sides by V, and you get P equals NR divided by V times T, which can be written as P equals KT, which is a direct proportion graph. So it's just this, P, T, and it's like this. N are separate constants. But we can combine them and say the whole thing is, if it's three constants, three constants multiplied together is another constant, right? So, okay. Right. Um, in terms of assignments, I'll try to answer your questions and uh, maybe we take a break in the middle of the session for, for a Q&A, but um, uh, The third one, V versus T. V versus T, so three. So this is just a mathematical exercise. We're not doing any physics yet. So V versus T. All right, I need to stop annotations. V versus T. You have to assume that N, V, uh, so N, P, and R are constant. And then you have P, V equals N, R, T. You divide both sides by P. Now V equals N, R divided by P multiplied by T. 
And you can see that this is uh, a constant. So you can replace it as V equals KT. And this is mm -hmm. and this is V versus T, and it's a straight line. It's a straight line graph. It's a direct proportion graph. And the gradient is K. The gradient is K, which is NR over P. Okay, finally, question four, V versus N versus N. So we have to assume that R, P, and T are constant. And in this case, it's going to be uh, V and N. So P, V equals N, R, T. So V is equal to R, T divided by P multiplied by N. And you can see that this is K, so V equals K, N. So it's a straight line graph. And the gradient in this case is R, T over P, whatever R, T, and P are. Okay. Uh, well, you, how do you know which one is a constant? Well, they ask you to draw the graph of V versus N and assuming everything else is constant. Uh, I mean, this is kind of the going... Um, yeah, the going theme. <laughs> Of, uh, of this ex exercise. Okay. P and V are variables. Yeah, so in P and V are variables, everything else is constant. P and T are variables, is constant. Okay. Now, of course, P is the pressure of a gas, V is the volume of a gas, N is the number of moles of a gas, R is, the, um, is a constant is a gas constant, and T is the temperature of a gas in Kelvin. So we'll come back to this equation because it's an incredibly important equation. Uh, but here I was just talking about relationships. So when we say, what is the relationship between P and T? Between P and T? Well, you can see it's a direct proportion because if T increases, P increases. It's a direct proportion. So P is directly proportional to T. V is directly proportional to T. V is directly proportional to N, you can see. Now P is inversely proportional to V. So it's proportional to one over V. Uh, T is inversely proportional to N. That's the weirdest one, I mean, um, I can't imagine a situation where you would change N and then as a result, T would change. How did they get this universal gas constant? Empirically, they did experiments and they saw that if the, pre if the pressure is P, uh, it just fits the equation. If we measured volume in, not in, if we didn't measure volume in cubic meters, if we measured in it in cubic feet, for example, we would have a different gas constant. It would be a different number. But uh, yeah, the universal gas constant is just um, an empirical value. Okay, now we talk about vectors. Still talking about maths. So this is a three-dimensional coordinate system and you see three coordinates, X, Y, and Z. And to, to locate a point, you have, to, um, you have to give three coordinates. So what are the coordinates of point A? It would be three numbers separated by a comma. 
C, 0, 0, 0. Thank you. A is 0, 0, 0. B, to go from A to B, you have to walk along the X axis, but you don't change anything on the Y axis. So the coordinate of B is going to be LX, 0, 0. The coordinate of point C, for example, would be LX, LY, 0. Uh, H would be 0 on the X, LY on the Y, and LZ on the Z. And finally, G would be LX, LY, LZ. Now, that's 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 cool. So you have you have a code. the you have the position of a point. Now the second thing that you the second thing that you need to consider is what if the particle is moving. If the particle is moving along the x axis, for example, in this direction, so the particle is moving in this direction, you would say it's its x component of velocity is um, its x component of velocity is um, uh, positive because it's moving along the x axis. So v we have the v x, v y, and v z. These are the components components of velocity. And V, which is Vx, Vy, and Vz, is the ve velocity vector. Vector. Example. Example. If the velocity is two zero zero. That means the particle is moving is the positive x direction. So let's say it's traveling from A to B. Traveling traveling from A to B. Okay, traveling from A to B, and uh, that means the x velocity is positive, and the y velocity and the z velocity is zero. Okay, so it's just moving along the x axis. Example one. Example two, let's say that the velocity is. 0, minus 1, 0. That means it is traveling. Uh, it's, it's traveling along the y-axis, and it's traveling backwards. So let's say it's traveling from C to B. C to B, traveling. Traveling from C to B. So basically, the components is how much it is traveling along a given axis. If it's moving, if a particle is moving from A to C, for example, three, moving from A to C, moving from A to C, the velocity would be something like uh, 1.5, to zero. So it's not moving along the z-axis. Does that make sense? In, on a scale of zero to 10, please. Can you let me know? Okay. 
So the thing to research would be 3D coordinates. Now, uh, can I just uh, pick on some people? Um, so people who with people who don't really understand. Can you ask a question in the chat? Like, what's um, what is confusing? From A to C, the top value. Oh, it, that doesn't matter. It could be could be two. I mean, it's not zero. It could be two. G. Imagine you are standing at A and you want to travel to G. You want to walk along the X, then you want to walk along the Y, and then you walk along the Z axis to arrive at point G. So you have to move along each three ax each of the three axes. A to B or C to B. Now I'm just going I'm just going, uh, so if the velocity is 2, 0, 0, so this is the component in the x direction, in the x direction. This is how fast it is moving in the x direction, so how fast it's moving in that direction. This is how fast it is moving in the y direction. Direction. And zero is how fast it's moving in the z direction. Direction. So if a particle is not moving in the z direction at all, that means it's zero. And it's not moving in the y direction. So this means it's moving only along this x-axis, moving parallel to the x-axis. Does that, does that uh, make more sense, Anika? Okay, lovely. Um, right. So you will see velocities. Velocity is a vector, and it can be represented as a column vector. Change in velocity is the final velocity minus the initial velocity. Let's say the particle was moving so change in velocity, another important thing, change in velocity. Change in velocity. Change in velocity. Let's say, suppose a particle was moving V initial is um, 2, 0, 0. And V final, it changed its speed. And the final velocity is 0, minus 1, uh, minus plus 3. Change in velocity, in velocity, would be delta V which is V minus V initial equals zero minus one three minus two zero zero would be zero minus two minus two minus one three. So that's the change in velocity. This is how much the velocity has changed. And this is a very important concept that we'll be talking about later uh, when velocity changes. Actually, right here, next. Okay, momentum. In physics, momentum is mass times velocity. Momentum is mass times velocity. But velocity is a vector. It has a direction. So velocity is a vector. So, and the mass is a scalar. It doesn't have direction. But that means that momentum is also a vector. And we write it as P equals M times V, velocity. Sorry. We usually write V like this. So this is like a small V, where this is a capital V. 
capital V stands for volume. Uh, because in this topic, we'll be using velocity and volume, we need to make a dis this distinction. We can't use just uh, V uh, and not specify which V. MV. Uh, perfect. So, let's say you want to find the change in momentum. And momentum is a vector. And I've shown you how to how to find this. So let's say we have a particle. It's a particle of mass uh, 0 0.2 kilograms. And it is traveling with velocity plus 4 meters a second. And it is bouncing back with velocity minus three meters a second. So it's hitting a wall and bouncing back. This happens in gases. So if you look at the gas, you can see a gas particle hitting the wall and bouncing back. So this happens all the time. So particle of mass. So what is the momentum, momentum initial, initial momentum? Remember, momentum is mass times velocity. Zero point eight, yes, it's zero point two times four. Zero point two times four, which is zero point eight kilogram meters per second. That's the unit for momentum. The final momentum is going to be 0 0.2 multiplied by negative 3 equals minus 0 0.6 kilogram meters per second. The change in momentum, change in momentum is delta P, which is P final minus P initial, which is minus 0 0.6 minus 0 0.8 which is minus 1.4 kilogram meters per second. That's the change in momentum of this particle when it hits the wall. Why, why, does, it, why does it matter? Why do we need change in momentum? Because if delta T is the time of the collision, we can find that the force the force of the particle on the wall is delta P divided by delta T. This is actually Newton's second law. It's written differently. You're used to it writ being written as F equals MA. But it's th this is the same thing. This is the same as that. So force is the change in momentum divided by, change, by, divided by the time taken for that change. So we can calculate the force of the particle on the wall. The particle hits the wall. How do we know what the force is? Well, we can calculate it. We can measure the speed before, speed after, and we can work, uh, work out how long the collision took, and we can find the force. Okay. So this is how you calculate the change in momentum. Any questions? Any questions? <laughs> okay. And F equals delta P divided by delta T. Well, Delta P, what is delta P? Delta P is uh, the final P final minus P initial, which is mass multiplied velocity final minus mass times velocity initial. We take M out as the common factor, M, V final minus V initial. And now we substitute that in. 
So we can say that this is M multiplied by V final minus V initial divided by delta T. But what is acceleration? Can somebody remind me? Acceleration is the change in velocity divided by change in time, which is V final minus V initial divided by time. So that is M times A. Yeah. Well, you can M delta V divided by delta T, which is MA. So that's how they are equivalent. Um, okay. Thank you for that question. That's um, a really nice one. Okay. Next thing. When we talk about gases, we have to distinguish between macroscopic and microscopic parameters. So when we talk, talk about macroscopic, microscopic, microscopic, is everything to do with a molecule. So for example, it's the speed of a molecule, speed of a molecule, molecule. mass of a molecule, a molecule. Uh, momentum. Momentum. When we talk about the macroscopic copic parameters, macroscopic is pressure. It's the temperature. Um, pressure, temperature, what else? Uh, volume. So the macroscopic param macroscopic quantities, quantities, and microscopic quantities. Okay. Now, what we're trying to establish how do you measure uh, how, how should you measure how long the collision takes in, in practice? Well, if you're talking about a ball hitting a wall, you would uh, video, make, take a video, and then you can measure from the video. Okay. Right. And so... What we're trying to establish in this topic is how the microscopic behavior of particles affects the macroscopic behavior of a gas. How microscopic, microscopic behavior of particles affects the macroscopic big behavior of the gas. Well, microscopic is everything to do with a single molecule, and microscopic is to do with the whole system. That's the, that's the difference. Okay, what is pressure? Pressure is very, it's a very important um, property of a gas. Let's have a look at this gas. This gas is made of tiny particles. We can think of them as like little marbles. And you can see that there's pressure. Okay. 
you can see that the particles, when the particles hit the wall, they exert a force on the wall. Particles, so what is pressure? Particles hit the wall. So, particles, particles hit the walls. They change momentum, change momentum. And because, and the force is equal to change in momentum divided by change in time, we've established that. In this, it's delta t, you can also interpret that as delta t, the time between collisions. Time between collisions or, uh, yeah. And then, Right, and then pressure is P equals, <laughs> see pressure is also P. Well, you, I'll use capital P for pressure. Pressure is force divided by area. Because there's an area involved, there's an area, A, and the particles keep hitting the wall and bouncing off, there's a force on the wall, and force divided by area is pressure. So pressure is due to the collisions of the particles with the walls. Let's have a look. The particles hit the walls, and that's why we have pressure. So the pressure is the particles hitting the walls. They change momentum. Change of momentum over time is force. Force over area is pressure. That's, that's what it is. Okay, uh, I do upload everything to YouTube. Yes, uh, we have a YouTube channel. Um, I'll share it with you at some point. It's also published on the website. Summation notation. So we're back to a little bit of maths. What is summa summation notation? What's sigma notation? Sigma. Sorry, so it's submission sigma. Sigma notation. Sigma notation simply means sum of. Sum of. It's the sum of i squared, where i squared takes all values from 1 to 8. It's the sum of i squared when i takes all values from 1 to 8. That's what it means. It's the sum of i squared where i is from 1 to 8 and simply means you substitute 1 squared plus 2 squared, plus 3 squared, plus 4 squared, plus 5 squared, plus 6 squared, plus 7 squared, plus 8 squared. That's what it means. So it's quite a simple mathematical operation. You get some confusing ones. So some students get confused with this. But there's nothing to, to be confused. There's no I. So effectively, this term does not change. And it's just... Uh, Two plus two plus two plus two plus two plus two plus plus two n times n times because you start from one to n and you can of course you can simplify that as two n. They're not factorials. Just num regular numbers i i is a variable. You could write the sum of k from 1 to 6, k squared. It doesn't matter. It's just uh, the, the variable that you're using. This one, n from 3 to 6. So we substitute 3 in, and we get 2 times 3. That's 6 minus 1, which is 5, plus substitute 4 in. 
So that's n equals 3, n equals 4. We substitute that in, and that becomes 8 minus 1, which is 7. We substitute 5, and that's 9. We substitute 6, and that's 11. N equals 6. That's it. We add them up. Uh, 20 plus 12, 32. Okay. A big, a big pi is used for iterating and multiplication. That is correct. It's the product of product of i equals 1, 2, 6, i squared, or whatever. All right. Some of a sequence, yeah, it could be some of a sequence. Like, and you can use, um, let's say, you have example. You have um, th four, four children have mass. Says. M1 equals 22 kilograms, M2 is 36 kilograms, M3 is uh, 41 kilograms, and M4 is, I don't know, 16 kilograms. Find the mean, the mean mass, mean mass. Well, you know how to calculate mean, I hope, uh, but it could be written like this. The sum of m i from i equals 1 to 4 divided by n, where n is the number of children. n equals 4. So that would be uh, the sum of 1. So that would be the sum of these. So m uh, would be m1 plus m2 plus m3 plus m4. So what you're doing is you're substituting i with 1 to 4, and 1, 2, 3, 4, divided by n. And of course, this is just 22 plus 36 plus 41 plus 16, divided by 4. This is, so 4. I won't calculate it, but it's just, it's just an example of how to use it. Okay. How to use this, the sigma notation. Okay. Root mean squared velocity. A very important concept. Root mean squared velocity. And why do we need it? Well, let's... Let's look at a, what is RMS, root mean squared velocity. So let's make a, um, what is, what is, is RMS velocity, root mean squared, root mean squared. squared okay suppose you have a gas and you want to calculate the average velocity of the particles average velocity of particles And you, you label all the particles from 1 to 26 trillion. Uh, and you find, add all of these velocities. But because about a, th about a sixth of the particles are moving in that direction, about a sixth of the particles are moving in that direction, about a sixth of them are moving in that direction, move that direction, that direction and that direction. We have six directions possible, yeah? So up, down, left, right, 
forward, backwards. So three dimensions, six directions. Approximately, approximately, totally one sixth of particles is moving in each direction. Direction. So if you were to sum all the velocities of the particles from 1 to n, where n is the number of particles in a gas, what do you think you would get if you add all of them? Zeno, why would you why 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 zero? They all cancel out, yes. And the mean velocity divided by n is also going to be zero. That's a pointless exercise. <laughs> why would we we take any gas and the mean velocity of the mean velocity of any uh, of any gas is going to be zero, and that makes sense because the whole gas is not going anywhere; it's staying where it is. As the mean velocity of all the particles is going to be zero, so mean v velocity is a pointless number. You could talk about mean speed possibly however it's not really good because you would have to what are you uh, do you need to find the absolute value do you find the the modulus of each uh, velocity it's a lot of um, a lot of computation energy so what we do is rather than finding the mean velocity, we find the mean square velocity. Mean square velocity. And that would be the sum of the velocity squared from 1 to n divided by n. And this now, because square cannot be negative, it's always going to be positive. V1, V1 squared, V1 squared, V squared, VI squared is always greater than zero because it is a positive value. And more to that, Y8, it's up, down, left, right, forward, backwards, X, Y, and Z, three directions, X positive, X negative, Y positive, Y negative. So a mean square velocity is a is a much more useful um, value. Okay, and it has another. There's another reason why it is so useful because if we think about it, the kinetic energy, kinetic energy, is one half m v squared. So total kinetic energy, kinetic energy of all particles, particles would be the sum of one half m i v i squared, where i is one to n. But that is. Uh, That is one half m i. You can take away the m m i, the mass of the particle, assuming that particles are identical. Okay, I'm just going to do this. M v i squared one to n. If you add all the kinetic energies of all the particles, you can take away the one half m because every particle is one half m. And this is the sum of vi squared. If you divide that by n and multiply that by n, this is the root mean is the root 
mean squared velocity. So the total kinetic energy is one half multiplied by the mass of the particle by n, which is the number of particles, times the root mean squared velocity. Mean squared, sorry, mean squared velocity. It's RMS squared, root mean squared, right? And the average, average kinetic energy of a particle, average kinetic energy of the particle is going to be uh, one half m n times v r m s squared divided by n, the number of particles, so n cancels out. So it's one half m v r m s squared. So this gives you the average kinetic energy of the particle, which is a very useful thing to, to know. I'll explain why later. <laughs> Sorry. So how do you calculate the root mean squared velocity? Well, very simple. You just square the values, add them, and divide by n. So we do V1 squared. So the root mean squared velocity is the square root of V1 squared plus V2 squared plus V3 squared plus V4 squared plus V5 squared divided by 5. So it's the square root of 350 squared, 350 squared plus 420 squared plus 690 squared plus 500 squared plus 480 squared. Okay, 350 plus 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 480 squared. Divide by 5, square root of that, it's about 501. It's about 501 uh, meters per second. That's the root mean squared velocity of the particles. Okay. What is the temperature of a gas? Well, I, I mentioned that um, root mean squared velocity is actually very important. And it turns out that the temperature of a gas, uh, that the mean kinetic energy of particles is equal to 3 over 2 kT, where T is the temperature. So if you want to find the temperature, you would, you would multiply everything by 2. 2 multiplied by the kinetic energy mean, mean kinetic energy, divided by 3 k, where k is um, is the Boltzmann constant. This Boltzmann constant is, uh, is it what? shame on shame on Vlad. Constant twenty Yeah, 1.38, yes, 1.38 times 10, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23. How, do, how could I have forgotten that? Uh, it's a Boltzmann constant. Constant. It's a good point, Y3. Well, um, Y 
Because that's not where the Boltzmann constant comes from. It like, doesn't come from uh, this equation. It comes from an, from uh, it comes from a different place, when that's why it's not uh, it's not useful to use uh, to combine it with the three 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 over two uh, Boltzmann. constant just look up the joule per kelvin joule per kelvin all right so the mean kinetic energy so the, we need also the mass it's a nitrogen nitrogen particle nitrogen nitrogen is n2 so it has a mass, mass of a nitrogen particle is 28 AMU, atomic mass units, which is 28 Right, 28 times 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27. Uh, so that's the one, uh, one AMU, one atomic mass unit, is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. It's just a constant. Uh, well, not just a constant, but it's the one twelfth of the mass of a carbon atom. So mass uh, of a nitrogen is 28 of those. So that's the mass of the nitrogen atom and so you can work out the kinetic the mean kinetic energy so it's two multiplied by one half mass times the velocity squared the rms mean velocity squared divided by three times uh boltzmann constant so the temperature of a gas two cancels and we get mv squared divided by 3k RMS is going to be 28 times 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 times the velocity, which is 501 squared, divided by 3 times 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23. And that should give us the temperature of 28 times 1.67 uh, times 10 minus 27 times 501 squared divided by 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 and divided by 3. 280. 280 Kelvin, which is approximately room temperature. Well, slightly more it's uh well okay it's seven degrees so it's about seven degrees celsius okay less than room temperature but i want you to appreciate that um k is kelvin is the is the is the pro proper unit for temperature uh kelvin temperature In Kelvin. Uh, so, for example, zero degrees Celsius is two hundred and seventy-three Kelvin. Uh, Twenty Celsius is two hundred and ninety-three Kelvin. So you just add two hundred and seventy-three to your temperature. So why do we need Kelvin? Well, because zero Kelvin, which is minus two hundred and seventy-three. Celsius is the lowest temperature possible. Is the called the absolute zero? Absolute zero. Lowest temperature possible. Possible. Yeah, the particles are not moving. Uh, okay, so that's. Uh, that's quite nice. I want you to appreciate that all we had is we had the speed of the particles 
and we knew the mass. Oh, when it's 3 over k, that's Boltzmann constant. That's small k. Yeah, I know, sorry, that's confusing. It's small k, but that's Boltzmann constant. And big k is Kelvin. Okay. We can derive, maybe in the next session, I will, I'm, I do want to derive uh, Ke equals 3 over 2 Kt. Uh, I'm just uh, wary of time and um, it's quite a complicated derivation. Uh, you, can, you can look it up, but I'll try to do it in one of the next sessions uh, because it's, it's really fun. It's really fun, but it is a year 13 topic. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll think, I'll think about it. I can stay longer. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, okay. What we, what we had, we, we only had the speeds of the particles of five particles and we worked out the temperature of a gas just from the speed of the particles. So, Knowing the temperature in the room, you can find the speed of the air particles in the in the in your room, which is quite I don't know. It's quite cool. I, I if, every time I think about it, it's just like hmm. and the speed r faster than sound. It have to be faster than sound because sound propagates because of the movement of the particles. If the particles were moving slower than sound, then um, Sound couldn't travel. <laughs> now, question eight for today, problem eight. Obtain the graphs from problem one experimentally. So let's re recap, what were the graphs? Oh, sorry, I meant problem two, of course. I meant problem two, but that that's not important. So these were the graphs. So what we what we want to do? So the, for the first graph, we want to keep n constant, r constant, and t constant. R is a constant, so we don't have to keep it constant. We just keep temperature constant. N is the num amount of particles. So n is the moles, is the amount of amount of substance, substance, so particles. So when we say n is constant, we mean that no particles are being added or removed. R, uh, T is temperature is constant. And what we need to do is we need to change the volume, change the volume and see how the pressure changes. Okay, so what is the volume? So let's add some particles. Let's actually add a mixture of particles. Okay, we keep the temperature constant at 300. We need something to measure the volume. Let's volume be the, the width of the container. So five units, so we don't, it doesn't matter what units we use. So when the volume is five, the pressure is 57. So when the volume is five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. One, two, three, four, five, five, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty. So five is that. 
So when the volume is 5, pressure is 57. Okay, now we change the volume. So we change the volume to 6. And you can see that the pressure drops to 47. 6, 47. So that's 57, so that's 40, 47 is here. 7. And it's 40, 7, and it's 40, 8, 9, 10. We increase the volume of the gas. The pressure drops to 36. 8 is 36. And you can see... Nine. Increase the volume of the gas. We make the gas bigger. Uh, well, the volume bigger. Thirty-one. Nine is thirty-one. And ten. Oh, you can go beyond ten. Uh, twenty-eight. Ten is twenty-eight. So you can see that's that's a neat graph. That does look like the graph that we have um, drawn, P versus V. It's the pressure versus volume of a gas. Right. And then uh, the second one was P versus T, so pressure versus temperature. Okay, so that was P versus V. Now P versus temperature. Okay. So now I keep the volume constant. So this is temperature, this is pressure. So let's start with um, 50, 100, 150, uh, 200, 250, 300. And the pressure, well, I don't know what the pressure is going to be, so let's go down to, let's go down to, um, let's cool, cool it down to 100, 250. Cooling the gas to 50 degrees, as you can see the particles are moving slower. And the pressure is 5 atmospheres. So for 50 degrees, it's about 5 atmospheres. So you're going to be 5, 10, 15, uh, 20, 25, 30. So five, 50 is 5, 100. So I heat the gas to 100 degrees. Kelvin, of course. And the pressure goes to 9.6-ish. 9.6-ish. You, you can see where I'm get, what I'm getting at. Yes, yeah, so uh, I heat the gas. And it's 14.6, approximately. So you can see that there's a trend. And of course, if the temperature is zero, the pressure is going to be zero. Let's see if that is actually true. Well, it makes perfect sense because the pressure is because particles hit the walls. If we drop the temperature to zero, that means the average kinetic energy of average kinetic energy of the particles is zero. The particles are not moving. Particles are not moving means that they're not hitting the walls. And if they're not hitting the walls, that means there's no pressure.
see zero zero temperature zero temperature zero pressure so indeed the graph thing okay is this a level science or higher um this is um i would say this is year 13 physics yeah this is a level but um Okay, so I hope this was a useful overview of gases, right? And uh, gas laws. Uh, mostly, uh, my the aim was today was to show you some math uh, math tricks that will help you in doing the assignment. Okay. Um, Zero Kelvin is theory is a theoretical temperature. We have never managed to achieve it. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's that. Next week we will go, we will do some combinatorics. Sometimes we will have guest speakers, uh, but obviously it's, it's difficult to get guest speakers. Um, uh, but we I try I try. Um, okay, so. I mean, good guest speaker. <laughs> um, I will do. I will do at least one webinar for each topic, and uh, I will be doing the math webinars as well. Yes, most of them. Um. <sighs> Yes, like most most of the course is based on A level, probably. Uh, so you'll be doing all sorts of things. Uh, sometimes going even slightly beyond beyond A level, but we try to keep it uh, accessible. Uh, right. What resource for physics compost to help complete the assignment? Well, we we give a lot of links in the in the assignment itself. There are links, so use those links. First of all, they use Isaac Physics. Use um, any textbooks, anything uh, that can help you. Um, yeah. The links is too simple compared to the actual questions. Ooh, that's a good point. Uh, thank you, Sadik. Um, That uh, yeah, that might be true. Once a, uh, it's not every Tuesday. I will I will skip some Tuesdays, but generally speaking, yes, I will I will give you a heads up when the webinars are happening. Now, normally, we accept uh, people who've done more than fifty percent uh, in both physics and maths. However, I cannot guarantee that this will happen this year because we don't know the numbers. People are still registering. We don't know how many people will submit the first assignment. But over the last three years, that has been the case. The people who got about 50% got in, below 50% didn't get in. If you got the certificate from last year, you're automatically in. Yes, yeah, so those of you who are who have completed year 10 uh, compost, you do need to submit the first assignment, though, of course. Yes, uh, this is a good line in your CV, but uh, just I think not everyone knows what compost is, so you would uh, please explain, like explain what compost is, that you had to work for three, four, five hours a week doing complicated physics and maths. All right. Uh, Priam, 100 in maths and 30 in physics. Uh, generally, no. Generally, that means we wouldn't take a person like that. But this is, uh, this the, we, we decide uh, individually. But generally speaking, uh, if you, if you have a very low score in physics, we probably th think that um, 
you can do you can do just maths in the follow along program okay the youtube channel um let's let me show you This is the YouTube channel. I'm going to upload. Oh, thank you, <laughs> Selena. Oh, if you type compost on YouTube, it pops up. That's that's really nice. That's good to know. Okay. All right. See you. See you next week, everyone, uh, for some maths. Uh, otherwise, good luck in uh, doing your assignment. See you. Bye, guys.